my uh, email, I have no watch, so I have my iPhone here just to give me a sense of where I am time-wise. Um, thank you so much for coming on a yucky rainy day. Um, Dan has been teasing me that this is the only time passion has been in play in one of these speeches, but as I explained over uh, lunch, it's, it really is a passion for me. Um, a colleague recently said to me, a colleague recently said, you know, this really isn't about the money. And um, I, I say that because I, I'm actually about to become the senior education research advisor. <laughs> Um, yes, it's lovely to have a promotion. I've been there for 20 years. But I, I think that, that really the passion for me um, stems from two sources. Uh, the one is being in Egypt in the late 80s on a fellowship uh, to learn Arabic. I was very struck by the children in the streets of Cairo who were selling tissues one by one. And the difference between them and me was really, it occurred to me, nothing more than educational opportunity. So that was my, my one driving force. Um, I went back and started all these different degrees from all these different universities and in the end really came out with a way to think about education programming for children um, within Save the Children and work globally for children, creating change by using data in a way that when I was a young professional at Save the Children, I didn't see happening and I found very frustrating. So in a way it sort of drove me from my early career helping to design programs, helping to think through how fundraising would work for programs, into how do we measure what we're doing and make it better in a cycle. No matter the funder, no matter the donor, how, what, how do we make what's happening for children on the ground more effective um, and take it to a broader scale, a broader audience, advocate based on, on the evidence. So that's why passion and evidence and innovation are all in my title. Um, because for me, that's what's driving change for children in the work that I do. I'm in the Department of Education and Child Development, which is one of four technical offices at Save the Children. So we have our technical staff, we have, square, uh, we have technical expertise in education and child development, um, and in school health and nutrition, those are our three program areas. Then we have a whole other part departments that have expertise in health and nutrition, we have another department that is for livelihoods, that's looking at issues of food security and economic development, and then we have another one that's all about emergencies, child protection. So that covers our, our sort of broad base. And that's the technical set. Then we have the whole administrative side that overlooks whether or not the programs are running and how they're running, et cetera. So that's sort of a, a brief about um, Save the Children. I went to write my roadmap, which is just my habit for keeping me on track, and it made me laugh because it's passion and evidence, innovation and change. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, we covered the passion a little bit, um, and I gave you a bit of the context of what's, what's going on um, for me and our department at Save the Children. I, the second piece of context I want to give you um, is about something that began in 2007 through a series of global talks. Save the Children, um, had always done community-based work, looking at how to bring local voices and local action into uh, policy realms, into programs at larger scale. But we really didn't have anywhere written down, agreed, bought into as a huge 5,000 strong uh, global organization of employees working together for something, a theory of change. So during 2007 and leading up to the 2008-2012 strategic plan, we actually spent countless, countless dialogue hours bringing this to fruition to have a sense of how we see the work that we do playing into a theory of change. And it's, I think the, the yellow boxes we talk about now, like, I mean, it's just like orange juice, peanut butter and jelly, we're like, oh no, we're being the innovator. <laughs> so, so be the innovator is about thinking through what is the problem, how am I going to solve it, will it work? So we're going to talk a lot today about develop and improve evidence-based replicable breakthrough solutions because that's a lot about where I live. Sometimes people say, well, what do you do? I do a lot of sort of R&D within the Department of Education to Child Development. Thinking through, like, what are the issues, how are we going to solve them, will it work? Be the voice is then taking that evidence and saying, Hey, look, partners, governments, donors, let's talk about this, look what we found. Um, achieving results at scale is also, again, saying, you know, this worked in these 20 schools, or these 50 schools, or these 500 schools, what about the other 20,000 in the country, et cetera? 
Um, build partnerships is gray and behind them not because it's less important, but because as we work through it, we realize that depending on the context and the project and the site, we would build partnerships to do any one of these things or all of them all at once. So the theory of change came into play as 2008, and this is 2008-2012 strategic plan started. This is about my 15 year to <coughs> save the children. And it's interesting because as we defined the priorities for innovation for that year, we thought we would maybe define a several every year going on through the strategic plan. And what we found, looking back, is that we still have a lot to learn from continuing to work on these six. So these were the first six. They remain the six. Um, so literacy and basic education, school-based malaria prevention, community case management, PDQ stands for Program Defined Quality for Youth, Engagement of Youth in their own discussion about programs of quality, Child-Friendly Spaces, which is an emergency program approach, and Community-Based Management Information Systems, which is used in health. So I am gonna talk a lot about the one that I was involved in, um, literacy, um, because I think it's, it's not that it's not going, it's, it's going on in many of the similar, way, similar ways across Save the Children, but it's in different phases. Um, an example is that community case management, it is at a spot, a place where when they started in 2008, they tried it in several countries and they thought they could do it in about three dozen more. So their questions were all about taking a great small thing and making it bigger. That was their innovation. What we tried to take on was very different because we started with a problem we knew existed and we started from why and then proceeded. So I'm gonna tell you the story of Literacy Boost and Super because it is how we began in 2008 to innovate uh, using evidence at three different points uh, along the way to test a new solution for children. And the program, the problem that we chose was literacy. You know, in the broader industry of education at this point, uh, I think 2006, 2007, there was a lot of dialogue, a lot of discussion about educational quality versus educational access. And had everybody been paying too much attention to access all along the way since John Tin or, or Dakar, the or education for all proclamations, were they all too focused on access or maybe not so much focused as it was the obvious thing to do to expand schooling and everybody assumed that if you expanded schooling, people would learn. But that assumption had fallen apart. And I think by 2006, 2007, everybody was saying, we think this has fallen apart. And this is just some data to look at um, how, how you need to dig deeper to see that it falls apart. This is DHS data from 2005 in Ghana, where the total population of six-year-olds, the, the cohort that ever attends school, 7881, that's huge progress since 1991. I don't know what the exact figures are from Ghana, but I can only imagine they were not anywhere near 78 or 81. The cohort to reach grade five, still really reasonable. The percent that can read at that point, tiny, tiny, tiny. So we have this going on in many, many countries, and you have other players, the World Bank, USAID, Research Triangle Institute, starting to do national sample assessments of reading and country after country after country coming up with the fact that there was a huge number of children who could read in a very limited fashion or couldn't read at all. So our first use of evidence was within our own program sites, taking into account this large trend to see what's going on in, say, the children's schools. Haiti, Nepal, Guatemala, and Ethiopia. These four sites are all sponsorship sites for Save the Children. So this is a place, this means it's a country where we are in a set of communities and we are going to be there for about 10 years. We have the children who are sponsored and the money that comes in from sponsoring children goes to community-wide programs. So you have a school with sponsored children in it and every child in the school is getting the benefits of their school-based programs. Um, and this is a really different kind of program site they, as compared to some other sites where if we have foundation funding to do two or three years work in 150 schools, it's gonna end and you have to figure out how to manage the ending or fundraise more. So it's, it's quite different to be working in sponsorship sites. Um, the other thing is that this is a little bit dangerous. I mean, you've been there for five years or so and nobody's reading, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna say? 
And in fact, we didn't have to face that. This is what we found. In Ethiopia, this is Ethiopia, Nepal, and Guatemala. The, uh, the yellow bars, those who could read one word or more in the minute on a fluency test. It's a pretty low standard. They could read something. The blue ones, unfortunately, are those who couldn't read at all. And we did a lot of digging around uh, during this data collection. There was additional information about what languages they spoke at home. Uh, the 4% in Guatemala were overwhelmingly of two different local uh, Mayan languages. Uh, and in Nepal, they were primarily Tagalog speaking. Ethiopia does not have that kind of language diversity. Um, they were primarily girls. So you know, we have like little nuances of pieces of what's going on with reading skills. But really, this is a lot to say these third graders uh, had gone through three years of schooling, and there was not much to show for it in terms of basic reading skills. I'm going to stop uh, a little bit right now on the what do we do about it, and talk a little bit about how do we find it. Um, because Save the Children isn't a research institution. We don't have large cadres of researchers that we send to the field to collect bunches of data. So you have to say, well, each one of these is 300, 500 kids. How do we get this data? What do we do? Um, in 2006, we started something called the Save University Partnership for Education Research, and Amina referred to it. Um, this is a way to really connect theory and practice. Uh, it's about what the practitioners and Save the Children sites, and actually now we partner NGO sites, we have partner NGOs that are participating now. What do they want to know about, but they don't have the time to read all the journal articles about, and they don't have the advanced research training, they don't have uh, a job that will let them say, you know what, for the next three weeks, I'm going to go to the field and not do all the other things that are on my job description as an NGO worker. So defining the topic is key because that's what's crucial for that program to move forward. And then once we have the topic, my job as the leader of this, of this initiative is to massage it into a scope of work that then lets me recruit a researcher. Somebody who is a doctoral student, who knows all this literature, who has the research skills, who brings to that country a sort of seminar. <laughs> it's like, let's do this. Like, the practitioner say, we want to do this, we want to know this, we want to do it better. And the researcher says, this is the design that will let us figure out how and then go, goes about building capacity in that office to train um, either the staff members or university partners on the ground, uh, and sometimes ministry officials. So we have a range of different, um, and, and sometimes other NGOs as well, depending on how we're implementing in the country. So, so the super partnership has really allowed us to take on this gathering of evidence in a more serious manner than we ever could um, by ourselves, really. And the other benefit is that because we have Someone central, uh, me and, and the other team players on, in the Department of Education and Child Development who are looking at you know, how do we measure elements of school readiness well, how do we measure literacy well, how do we look at youth development assets well. We have people who are experts in that, but also can't take the time from our jobs to do you know, long research. Um, we're looking at it at a global level and we're able to try it again and again and again and again and again. So rather than one country office moving forward and trying something and getting great results, and that's that. It's feeding back into a system, so we're all honing our ability through super to gather evidence, to think about evidence, and, and to really have a set of tools that we know we can rely on in future projects. Our university partners. <laughs> I've divided them into two columns, not alphabetically, but the first column are our universities that have actually sent to the field. Um, some have sent several, some have sent um, just one or two. And the other, the sort of interested observers. And, and for whatever reason, none of the scopes have ever fit their particular students or things like that. It's just catch a catch can. But they're all partners and they're all engaged um, in how this works. And the professors that are behind the students help to mentor and think through the designs, the answer questions. Uh, in five years, we've done 45 studies in 22 countries with that list of 15 universities. And I believe that on the website was posted a summary sheet. Um, it's got like a one-page reefer, which in the world of NGOs is always the thing you have to produce. It's got a one-page reefer on most of the 45 
Um, the problem that document, as soon as I write it, another super study is finished and then it's out of date, but it's got many of the 45 in it. Um, so when we found the, the, the evidence that there was not reading going on uh, very well among the third graders in those three countries, and Haiti was similar, I didn't put a graph in about Haiti, um, we then realized we needed to look again at evidence, not that we generated, but all the evidence around about developing reading skills. Um, to figure out what to do next. So we looked at the research, uh, reading instruction, teacher training, uh, motivation to read inside of school, and, and other factors that are known in other contexts to influence reading skills development. The thing about this process is that in most of the places we're working, there's not been a study of reading skills development. So we have to sort of think about, these are the research results, but if you extrapolate it to X, Y, or Z country, what do you need to think about next? So, if you look at all the research in uh, the National Reading Council panel, it's all based on kids who spent the first six years of their lives surrounded by print. So, how can you apply that somewhere else? What, what pieces do apply? What pieces might not apply? What do you have to be careful about when you say, this is the important thing in the research? So, that was part of the, one part of the process of developing a solution. The second part was to do reviews of our own resources and our own practice. Because it's not to say we hadn't been doing anything to address quality, we just need to know exactly what we've tried already. So this is a review of teacher training, a review of community action for reading, and a review of assessment. So these three different reviews went on um, in late 2007 and into early 2008. We did scans of good practice outside of Save the Children, who were the hot literacy groups working in various countries and contexts of the world, um, different people working with youth in terms of non-formal education and promoting reading skills. Um, and then, as I said, we, we started through these feasibility issues. What could be extrapolated, but then programmatically, what's feasible to try to take across a large number of sites? And I put scripted to remind me to tell you the story about um, the teacher training. It's, very popular in these days to, to say, you know, gotta script the curriculum, gotta change the curriculum, gotta, you know, have the Latin linguists come in and do decodable books and based on a totally different curriculum, tell the government to change the curriculum. That's really not somewhere that say the children go. So script all those sort of scripted, very directed approaches to reading instruction. Sort of had said, well, maybe they could be applied in some places, but we really aren't going to go and say to children and say, change your curriculum. So that's why that's that's the extreme feasibility. But but it is. I mean, people ask me all the time, why aren't you doing scripted? It's the thing that works. And I have to say, because who am I to go and say to the from the government of Mozambique, change your curriculum? <laughs> um, and even if I did, which language of Mozambique would I do it in? Uh, it's not my. It's not our call. So. Um, I wanted to give you the four principles that we came up through this, pro with, through this process, building on what the research says. Um, ooh, this has funky. Reading development is essential in early grades of primary school and entails development of letter knowledge, biological awareness, fluency. Anybody recognize this? Anyone? Anyone? Snow Ribbon? <coughs> Come on. Uh, so, <laughs> building on the National Reading Council, we look at that, you know, we really have to address these five skills. We need to do it early. That's the principle for programming that we took out from there. Uh, next, Professor Wright. Reading is complex, cognitive, social, and cultural as an activity. Its development leads to literacy, which is at once an individual competence, a social act, and a cultural tool. Therefore, in our programs, we want to link reading to life in content and activity. Next. The real predictive power of motivation to read must be lit and sustained using child-centered and active learning approaches that ensure progress and success to higher levels of education. You have to make it active and fun. It's going to catch on. And last, children's literacy development happens in schools and homes and requires materials. Seems basic, I know. Depends on both teachers and parents and on finding the materials to reach the type and amount of reading materials in children's lives. Therefore, we must address reading and reading materials inside schools and outside of schools. So these are sort of the four key pieces that, from our review of literature, we said, you know what, this has got to be the core of the content. So from there, we decided we drafted a literacy boost toolkit with 
three components that can be adapted to fit the context. And by context here, I mean the national curriculum for the teacher training, I mean the existing program for the community action, um, and I mean the ages and stages of where the, of the children's skills for the assessment. So each piece is flexible and needs adaptation to the place that we're going to do it. When you put them together, they, want, they aim to enhance literacy instruction, boost literacy habits and the print environment around the children, and demonstrate results. So we charted to do this in a number of countries. Uh, skills assessment, here you see two pictures are from Pakistan on that end, and this is Ethiopia doing some reading assessments. Teacher training, looking at local materials, uh, individualized feedback, well, trio feedback, I guess you call that. Um, and then, this is again local materials being used. This, this teacher is uh, <coughs> doing a, a phonics chart in Malawi, something never seen in a classroom in this area before. Um, and then the community action component, which is really about different types of reading activities and reading opportunities in the communities. Reading camps, reading buddies, older children, reading younger children. Just the mere fact that there are books there. Really, really important one. Here you see three different pictures of things created by parents. And the parents go to a workshop and they learn that some kids are at building their vocabulary through pictures. So that stage is needed in their book bank in their local community. Other children are learning to become more fluent readers, so they need a story written on the, from the local lore. Um, this is some Pakistani letter cards that were made locally. So it's not all you know, flying in, dump, dumping books. This is about engaging with parents, engaging with communities, and seeing what's important, and then they can take it and run with it. Literacy Boost, uh, at this point, was a draft, and in talking about it with our colleagues in the field and figuring out where to test it, um, we were often said, well, why should we? We said, well, you know, it's in our business plan, it's in our theory of action, it's in our, it's all, all our internal things, but it's also a big part of two uh, EFA goals. It definitely plays most directly into goal six with measuring learning outcomes, uh, especially in literacy. And actually, we have delved into the measurement of numeracy anyway. Um, and then number six as well to ensure that children have access to a complete, free, and, complete, and primary education of good quality. Quality being the key word there. Um, so now we come back to the evidence. We have this beautiful toolkit. We feel it's based in all kinds of good things about practice and research. Does it work? We have to go back to generating our own evidence. Super, again, comes into play. We're not a research institution. We're our partners. Super supported longitudinal studies of, of reading skills in Malawi, Nepal, the Philippines, and Yemen. The Philippines uh, and Yemen are both still baselines. They have not come to an end line at this point in their programming. Um, and then also, if, through this tool development, and sort of knowing better how to train people to measure which pieces of reading skills might be relevant in the context. Um, we built capacity in our own teams, our own staff, in Pakistan, Mozambique, Vietnam, Ethiopia, Haiti, Mali, Guatemala, Bangladesh. They're doing it themselves. Okay, so, so again, it's sort of institutionally, it's enabled a change because we have contact with the researchers who come and know so much more about applying these research methods, about the literature that it contributes to. We really upped the ante, and I was in a meeting last September of five African countries. All of them are implementing in a different stage of literacy boost. Some just on assessments, some are in year two, others are experts in teacher training. And they were all having a debate about phonological awareness. And I thought, not 10 years ago, not five years ago, did I think that this was possible. But I think the constant contact with those who are really trained in some of the much more advanced, much more state-of-the-art than any of us come in contact in our daily life uh, has really transformed the kind of work we do, the kind of dialogue we have. Uh, it's, been, it's been fantastic. Um, now comes the change part of the talk, the fun, excitement, the good news, and some of the bad news. Um, I wanted to share some of the results. Nepal, Pakistan, and Malawi have done at least one year each. Um, and we're analyzing Mozambique right now. Um, this is Nepal, if you're one, you can see these are gain scores for some reason. Oh, there it is. They're average gain scores during the school year. So these are second graders um, who very clearly, they started as equals to their comparison groups. And every one of these is statistically significant. Um, 
And so we conclude that Literacy Boost had an impact. So this mix of inputs about community and teaching uh, and materials had an impact for this group of children in second grade. The intervention is school-wide in all of these cases, so we're seeing an impact in the grade that was selected for assessment, but we're hoping slash assuming it was school-wide um, for the variety of skills that we're looking at. Um, we don't have enough money to assess everybody everywhere, so we're talking about a, a specific grade, and it's for a specific reason. Um, in Nepal, they do it in the second grade because they really feel that foundational skills, according to their standards in the, in the government standards, should be there by then. That these children should know all of their letters, they should have you know, a basic sense of the vocabulary that's in the curriculum, and be working towards fluency. So, so these are sort of basic curriculum senses. In Malawi, they do it in grade four because in grade five, they go to English as a medium of instruction. So if they're not reading the national language by grade four fluently, accurately, and with comprehension, got a big problem on our hands. So again, it's, it's not the same everywhere. You have to adapt it, and this is the case where we're adapting assessments. Um, yes, sir? Can I ask a question about this? Sure. Um, you have the comparison for one of the things that some people are really interested in these days is how you can implement a study where, in some cases, you're putting in something like SAVE's program called literacy groups and other places you're not. How do you do that, let's say, just in any how study? Yeah, it's tricky. It's, all, it's always tricky. And it's tricky on a variety of levels. Um, I mean, obviously, it's tricky ethically. How can you not do it? Well, the, the answer to that is you can't do everything. You don't have unlimited funding. Um, our favorite way to do it is to be in a sponsorship site that has just begun in an area. So we have 10 schools this year, and we have a slate of five years growing that we're gonna grow across X number of schools. Some, some country offices have a bigger scale than others, but the example of Malawi, um, and this is a case I'll share with you a little bit, they started in 10 schools in 2009, um, and their plan, their entire program plan, was to roll out across 10 to 12 schools a year for five years. And so the design sort of followed that rolling out. So you were going to a, a control community and saying, we're going to collect data and it's going to form our work for when we get here next year. So it's not, uh, I mean, our, our country staff have a hard time with controlled schools that are, get nothing and never will get anything. They, they don't like to be on the ground doing it. They don't like to be on the ground next door to it. It's hard. It's very hard. Um, so that's why that's our favorite way. The other way is um, sometimes we work, and the case in Nepal is this way, uh, we work with a large local NGO in the area where we did this pilot study. Um, and they have a huge number of schools there. And so, and they implemented literacy moves. We did, we trained them side by side to implement literacy moves. So they had a large number of schools from which they felt completely fine in collecting some more data. And they are fundraising to go all the way across their schools with literacy moves. So again, it's, it's case by case, but we try to solve it so that if not this year, next, if not you know, sort of moving forward in that way. Um, not, I didn't want to be accused of having only number evidence. So this is a visual of how things changed in Nepal. Uh, the superfellow there um, was informed by a prior superfellow uh, who said, you know, a picture evidence would be great to take. So she studiously took pictures pre and post in all the literacy used and control sites. And this is a pre, um, all, all the sites were pretty much like this. If they had walls, some of them didn't have walls. Um, and this is the four post literacy boost classes. Um, room, room to Read is a strong partner in Nepal, so it's very professional looking. Um, but I included this one because you can see the book, these are book bank materials. So some of the locally generated um, reading materials are hung on a string across the front of this teacher's room. In Pakistan, as an interesting case um, where we have both Pashtu and Urdu fluency being promoted through Literacy Boost. So all, all the community activities, all of the community uh, book banks have both Pashto and Urdu books, but there are all the activities themselves are conducted in Pashto, which is their mother tongue. But you see the benefit to Urdu. They're still going to school in Urdu, and the teachers are being trained how to teach Urdu letters and Urdu fluency and Urdu phoneme awareness better. Um, but it's really a sort of two language approach to taking on the development of reading skills. And it had huge results. Who knew? I mean, 
a lot of you wouldn't say that, I know, but. <laughs> um, and this team, I mean, I think I say who knew, this team too was really passionate about what they were up to and how it was gonna benefit for the kids that, that they were working with. This one was implemented in a large grant. So this isn't a sponsorship site, it was a large grant setting, 150 schools. Um, so this is actually not a comparison of literacy boost versus nothing. This is a comparison of Save the Children's Status Quo versus Save the Children's Status Quo plus literacy boost. So it really makes the argument that, yes, we were doing good, but now we're doing more good, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, these are two reading camps. You'll notice the, this boys' camp and there's a girls' camp. Um, my colleague, Sasha Shoa, who's our senior advisor, who's our advisor for basic education and literacy, um, was with this camp and just was writing to me these emails about just how magical these girls and their discussions were over you know, all the books that they had and things that you know, they came together when they could. Um, the camps were set up originally to be once every two weeks, and most of them met three to four times a week. And different communities decided different things. We actually had a few camps in, I forget if it was in Apollo, they, they met daily for like two hours. I mean, it just caught on like wire, wildfire in some places, so it was fun, it was fun to see. Um, Malawi this year did their second year of implementation. They were first off the block and had similar first year results to Pakistan and Nepal. Um, what we found when we went to go and do the start of the year data collection this year, anybody see it? Who's the researcher in the room? Dan, do you see it? We had non-equivalent groups. These kids walked into school the next year. The next year, fourth graders walked in not equivalent to the kids down the street. <laughs> the first, they're like, oh, our research design is dusted. And they said, wait a minute. We had school-wide impact. The kids who came back the next year weren't assessed last year. Last year, we proved that it worked among the fourth graders that last year. This year, 2010, they came to school. We did an assessment. They were already different. These different are, they were already significantly different than the kids in the control schools control down the road. Oh, and I need to explain, it wasn't control schools just down the road each time. Control schools right now are the ones at the farthest end, so that we have several years of control schools before they become sponsorship schools. But we're having fights about it, Dan. We're having fights about how soon they can take it across. If they can raise another grant, can they go all the way across all the schools now? It's, it's very tricky, very tricky. Um, so what did we do? We compared the end of year, 2009 with the end of year 2010. So this would be the kid, the kids in the blue would be those that had one year of literacy boost action. The kids in the yellow had two. One is third graders, one is fourth graders. We're on our way. Very exciting stuff. We couldn't figure out what happened with the fluency though. So it's okay, wait. Good news, good news, good news. Not so good news. What's going on? And what's exciting now is that instead of saying, oh, don't hide it, no, no just don't take it off the graph, everybody's saying, well, wait a minute, let's look at that. Is it girls? Is it boys? What's going on? Do we need to do more? Can we do less? Has everybody been looking at the influency activities in their classrooms? Have all the reading camps been reading and holding their finger under the line? So, so our field staff are taking this data point and thinking about their practice now and saying, we're not supporting fluency as well as some of the other stuff. What can we do next? So it's really exciting that, yeah, well, it's bad news, but it's actually a point for discussion, not seen really as like bad news, hide it under the rug, don't let the donor see it. Yeah? Uh, we're also looking at gain scores. And so uh, those are actually not the scores of fluency. Those are actually differences between. No, no, the time is wrong, I'm sorry. No, wait, hold on. Standard four, you're right. No, I'm just saying no, you're right, you're right. other kinds of explanations different. because you have different populations in each of those. They're actually not control groups for themselves. They're, they're comparing pre and post of the blues and pre and post of the yellow, which could mean that the gain scores could be that we have a different population that started lower in fluency in the cohort from 2009, mm -hmm. and you actually have if I'm reading that right. No, this cohort wasn't taken again. This is the, the end line 2009 had this finding, that the students in, in the literacy boost schools gave 17 words per minute on average. So then the following year,
year, the fourth grade class. This that was, is before literacy boost. No, no, 2009 was the first year of literacy boost in, in Malawi. So the next year, the standard four students learned this much. This is how much they gained during the school year. So the question that the team had on the ground is, we promoted 14 words per minute of growth in the standard four students the first year. Why only six in the second year? What happened? What, what were we doing as well? Or what do we need to revisit for year three? Excuse me, this, the year two were kids who had done in, who had two years worth of Yeah, well, they were third graders in the first year, and then they were in fourth grade, and they got sampled for a yeah, we, There are good explanations. Maybe we'll talk about that later, but uh, that brings up a pretty good explanation. Or part of it. In some places, just a part of it. 
Um, in Haiti, they actually did do a scripted teacher training approach because they don't have a national curriculum. So when we look through our lens and say what's possible, it is possible to script a Haitian Creole um, curriculum and implement it in just our schools. And, and so we'll see when we have some more data how that went coming down the line. All of this has led to more questions. And to be completely honest, I think much better questions. Um, we're asking things about emergent literacy and math. What happens when we start earlier? Because say the children have some child development programs in many of these sites as well. So what happens if we beef up how we're imparting those skills in our preschools? Some of our specialists go around the world and they call me and they say, I need an emergent literacy and emergent math slideshow so that I can, we can talk about this in, you know, in a workshop next week with you know, our staff, the ministry staff. They start these discussions because the specialists go out and they see um, preschools that have the kids sitting in rows doing workbooks. Uh, sort of the, the academicization of preschool, huge trend that we've been seeing in a lot of the early childhood work that we're doing, especially in Asia, I think. Um, so we've, we're developing a toolkit that has to do with play and emergent literacy and maths. What are the basic skills and how do you promote them in play? All kinds of fun games and things that one's been fun to work on. Um, second language learners has become a huge issue as they show up time and again among the groups that don't read, or the groups that are reading slowly, or the groups that read with zero accuracy. Or, most interesting to me, the groups who read with fluency and accuracy and don't have a sense at all of what they read. As soon as it became proven once or twice, three times, uh, a lot of different area directors who are the big money handlers shifting it around uh, said, what does it cost? Yes, yes, our country staff, our technical staff is at us. We want to talk, start at what does it cost and how cost effective is it? Uh, so that's another, those, those three actually are the, are the hot topics in our super scopes of work this year, I would say. Um, and the last two are, are really looking at scale and scalability. As an institution, how do we take on interventions at the community sites? Uh, how do we take those to scale? How do you go to scale with community relationships? What does that mean, really? If you're going to do this through a, USA RFP or try to take it into a partner NGO's 500 sites. What does it look like to take your relationships that work well for you as, as say the children and X, Y, Z community to scale somewhere else? Um, and the last is technology and literacy. We all feel like there's got to be something that we could be doing that's realistic and doesn't chew up too many batteries. <laughs> Something's got to fit with literacy boost. Um, and technology, but we haven't defined it yet, and I think that's sort of our next, one of our next R&D um, explorations. I think that's it. I feel like I talked forever. <laughs> I feel like, oh, I have 13 minutes left. I'm early. Yay! <laughs>